if you think of professional athletes, they do a lot of training. Um, calculus community is over 5 million people now. The people at the top are, it, it's just like gone from more of an amateur sport to more of a professional sport, right? And so I think people, I think the difference isn't that the results would be better, but the top performers now would get to those results faster. You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show where we learn about making machine learning models work in the real world. I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. Anthony Goldblum is the co-founder and CEO of Kaggle. Kaggle started as a competitions platform and is probably the largest community of data scientists and machine learning practitioners on the planet. They also now do data sets and kernels, and we're going to talk a lot about that. I'm super excited to talk to him today. I remember you were talking about deep learning before I'd really heard about it. You're kind of the first person I knew that was really thinking about it. And I think it was because you saw that people were winning Kaggle competitions with kind of new methods that were less in the mainstream at the time. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering if on Kaggle you're seeing people doing things that you don't think are in the academic mainstream, or if you're seeing things that um, kind of point to what you think will be in sort of mainstream production in the next few years. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, th to be honest, the most glaring thing that we see on Kaggle that is not uh, fashionable in academia is that we're still seeing gradient boosting machines do very well on a lot of structured data problems, right? And there's not a lot of research attention um, on things like gradient boosting machines now. And it, 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 it begs the question, like, have we done everything we can there? Or is it an area where there is still more that can be done, but it's just not the trendy thing. It's hard to get papers published. And so it's just not getting the attention. To be honest, that's the that's the most glaring difference uh, we see between what is doing well on Kaggle and what is fashionable um, in the academic literature. Well, that's really interesting. We are seeing um, some novel uses of things like um, BERT and WaveNet. We've seen WaveNet um, be used on um, forecasting problems. We've seen BERT do really well on chemical informatics type pro or uh, so, sorry, problems that uh, have to do with gene sequences and things like that. So we're seeing like use cases, perhaps unknown use cases uh, for, for some well-established technologies. But I think the just the lack of academic focus on this on these gradient boosting machine algorithms is probably the biggest glaring distinction that we see. And so in like a structured data competition that where gradient boost wins, what are the details that the winners do to win those competitions? Like, is it is it still feature engineering or is there other stuff? Yeah, that, uh... exactly. And it's it's finding uh, clever features that other people aren't finding. Um, um, and so, so perhaps that's it. Um, um, that's the reason, like... Um, or maybe that's where the that's where uh, you could have more academic focus. Like, are there ways to there? There is no doubt in my mind there are things you could do to automate feature engineering to some extent. And maybe these are the things that companies like Data Robot and H two O are doing, where they're baking in these recipes. So, um, as an example, you see a date or a timestamp, for instance. That is an incredibly rich uh, field that can become like seventy things. Like, right? Like, let's say you're doing traffic forecasting, a timestamp can be turned into is it rush hour is it not rush hour is it a weekend is it not weekend is it summer is it winter you know therefore does it change the probability of rain um on a on, you know on a given day or adverse you know snow on the road and things like that there are definitely things that could be done to automate um components or help with some of the heavy lifting of feature engineering and so you know that could be an area of focus or or perhaps it is you know maybe it's not an academic area but it's the kind of things that h2o and and, and data robot and companies like that can can build into their products well that's so interesting if you like so if you roll back uh, 10 years or like you, you took a competition at the start of Kaggle and then you, you take it out to today. Like how much better do, do people do? Do they even do better? Like, do you think you could win? Could you take modern tools and win every competition, um, at the start of Kaggle or, or is, I guess my question is, has the feature engineering really improved? So the thing, um, when Kaggle first got started, um, people used to use all sorts of things like support vector machines, self-organizing maps, you know, like really a, a large range of things. And the first big development that we saw um, or the first big contribution I think Kaggle made is we made it very clear that Random Forest was um, was the best um, uh, algorithm for actually, actually most problems at that time. Um, and, uh, and then let's say around the 2014, 2000, and, yeah, about 2014, Tianqi Chen at the University of Washington released XGBoost. Um, and I think it was always thought that gradient boosting machines should be better 
you know, like, like you know, there are, it's a very smart approach to ensembling decision trees. Um, they they should be better. Um, they're very very finicky before XG Boost. And when uh, Tianqi Chen launched XG Boost, it really took over from Random Forest. Um, I'd say, unlike the difference between um, deep neural networks on computer vision problems versus random forests. Like the the XG boost increase was not is not a huge increase, but it was enough. Um, and so to be honest, on structured data problems, I think that's probably where most of the like software driven um, improvements have come from. It's probably the case if you took a problem from the early days of Kaggle that was one with random forest and you re-ran it today, I think you'd get a little bit of a better answer because of the XG boost. I don't actually think the way people are doing feature engineering has really improved very much. However, I do think that you would get... What, what we always say is that Kaggle competitions typically, you know, the top teams all converge on about the same level of, level of accuracy. And the intuition there is there's only so much signal in a data set, right? And so people compete to the point where they've extracted all the signal. Um, and so I, I believe in the early Kaggle competitions, people always found the, the key features and they got all the signal out of the data set. I think what might happen is um, it had happened a fair bit faster now. If you think of professional athletes, they do a lot of training. Um, Calculus community is over 5 million people now. The people at the top are, it, it's just like gone from more of an amateur sport to more of a professional sport, right? And so I think people, I think the difference isn't that the results would be better, but um, um, the, the, the top performers now would get to those results faster. Mm-hmm. Um, is, Interesting. Is, uh, is, is, is my guess. Um, there are definitely, we have, um, we ran a, challenge with Pete Warden, who's uh, now at Google. He was running a company called Jetpack, and I think it was a cat, distinguished between cats versus dogs. And I think we did that, if I remember correctly, we did that before deep neural networks and afterwards, and obviously saw a fa- fairly big lift. Um, we ran a challenge with the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence on solving an eighth grade science quiz. This was before the, you know, the BERT innovations. People mm-hmm. were getting about 60% accuracy using information retrieval methods. Um, Alan have now, you know, run Bert like solutions on it and they're getting about 90%. So you oh, definitely, wow. yeah. Wow, so you, you, yeah, you, de- you definitely see um, anything, um, you know, the before deep learning and after deep learning, you see very large changes uh, in, the, in, in results for sure. And I would think that on some structured data, like language models and things would really make a big difference, right? Yeah. I mean, so what, what you, you definitely have structured data where you have fields that are, you know, text fields, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, maybe you use language models as, as a, um, you know, to create features that ultimately uh, go into. I mean, that's that's a common strategy. We run multimodal c- competitions sometimes where you have images and someone will run a convolutional neural network in order to come out with um, features out of that image that just that then get fed into a... Um, you know, like a gradient boosting, a gradient boosting machine classifier. So that definitely happens. And so mm-hmm. just as it gets done for, um, for, for images that might be part of a multimodal data set, of course it, it can happen as well. Um, when there are columns that are text or, or, you know, data sources for a challenge that are text. Are there, are there interesting like data augmentation strategies that you see people using? Like, is, I feel like that's often people talk about that as a major area of innovation. Like, is that, is, do you see that on Kaggle? There's a couple of ways people win Kaggle competitions. Um, in the world of structured data problems, it's clever feature engineering. It's very often that um, uh, let's let's say for um, natural language processing or um, for computer vision problems, it's clever data augmentation that wins uh, competitions. You know, some of my favorite examples, the Kaggle community is really creative. Um, I remember we, I think it was with Cora, we did a challenge around... Um, detecting insincere questions. I think that was the challenge. Um, and the winning strategy there or the, the thing that the winners did that others didn't do is that what they would do is they would translate the question from English to some other language and then translate it back. Because if you use Google Translate, it's not a symmetrical translation, right? And so it was like a clever way to in, to uh, augment their data set. Um, um, so there are, there are like the standard techniques, you know, rotating, et cetera, for images, but then there are... Um, you know, there are cl- clever creative tricks, you know, like that translation one. Um, 
Um, there have also been a bunch of, you know, one of the libraries that has really taken off on a Kaggle, I think it was written by a Kaggle master, it's called Applementations, which uh, uh, makes it much easier to do sophisticated data augmentation, particularly on uh, that, that's designed for images. So uh, it's definitely an area of a lot of focus in our community. That's really interesting. Do you think that with feature engineering and augmentation being so important and then also like compute resources increasing, is has overfitting in the training process become more of a problem over time if people come up with new ways to address that? Like I would think that if I'm just spinning through like millions of possible feature combinations, I would end up overfitting on the validation data, right? Earlier, I said there are two things required to win Kaggle competitions, tenacity and creativity. I actually think there are three, um, and that's being you know, statistically wise, right? Um, so one pattern we see all the time with people who are competing in their first Kaggle competition is they'll submit, they'll be top of the public leaderboard, um, um, and then what we do is we, at the end of a competition, we rescore everybody's algorithms on a second test data set that they've never seen before um, and also let's say you put in you submitted 150 models you have to select two that get rescored right um, and so a very 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 common pattern is that somebody will be on top of the public leaderboard we then rescore them on the second test data set and then they've dropped like 90 places um, and it turns out to be an amazing way to learn the lesson of overfitting because um, you know you, you're staying up till midnight our leaderboards turn over midnight UC, UTC that's when we reveal who actually won and so you're staying up till midnight you're hitting refresh 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 you know am I in first am I in first um, and you look at the public leaderboard the private leaderboard when we switch over you're not in first you're not in second you're in you're in 80th position um, that, that person who overfits, uh, it, you know, in a situation like that, they never overfit again, right? Um, um, and I'd say that if anything um, that was a bigger problem, coming back to your question, has overfitting become on the, the validations that become more prevalent, I would actually say it's become less prevalent because it has become... Um, well known that to do well on Kaggle, you you really need to be careful of overfitting. Um, but just one more kind of adjacent point I want to make here is you'd be surprised at the credentials of some of the people who have you know, had that happen to them, where you know they're they're coming first and then they drop to a hundredth spot. And makes me wonder how many of the world's research papers are actually overfitted. You know how many of the world's algorithms in production are overfitted if experienced good people who have a lot of models in production or a lot of research papers out in the world when they come to Kaggle in, in a place where they cannot overfit and they still overfit. Um, it, yeah, it really does make me wonder, like, what, what percentage of the world's, world's algorithms are actually overfit? I mean, it sounds really tough, right? Because I, I feel like uh, I imagine myself in this situation where I'm trying to, to be statistically rigorous, but I think, like, when you're testing lots of features, you know, I, I feel like it's tough to be perfectly statistically rigorous in that process like do you, do you have like a sense of best practices that you tell people or where do people land that they don't overfit at all i think it's cross validation um, um i think cross validation works well if you have a there there are techniques um uh, as a google researcher Moritz Hart, who um has a kind of clever approach if you have a very small data set and um it's difficult to cross validate um where you you don't Give you you don't tell your you don't get told that your algorithm outperformed unless it outperformed by a statistically significant margin is the intuition there. Mm -hmm. So you, you either get no information <laughs> or you outperform by a meaningful. That actually amount. sounds pretty good. Although you might you, you might miss stuff, I suppose. But yeah, that's that's an interesting idea. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I think I think cross validation is still the right approach if you have a large enough data set, um, and if you don't, you know, Maritza's technique is at least the one I'm aware of that um, um, that that allows you to um, yeah to to, to still uh, prevent against overfitting. Interesting. Well, so one thing I really wanted to ask you um, is is you know I feel like there's almost like this trope in the the ML zeitgeist that's like, you know, the real world isn't a Kaggle competition. I'm sure people ask you about this all the time, but I was curious what you think about that, like what the differences are. Like do Kaggle grandmasters tend to um, do well in the real world? Like do like what parts of Kaggle translates to um, actual applications? What parts don't? Yeah. So, so I guess there are two, um, there are, let's, let's back it 
machine learning into or, or building a successful um, productionized machine learning model into three stages. Firstly, you've got to turn your business problem into a um, machine learning problem. The second is you've got to, you know, train a classifier that's robust, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that really works. And then the third is you have to productionize that classifier. Um, um, Kaggle is obviously phenomenal for number two. I, um, I, I really think um, um, you, if you do well on Kaggle or you train through Kaggle, you become um, as good as anybody in the world on number two. Um, um, and, I, and, and I just want to maybe extend that um, a little bit more. A wonderful story from a very elite Kaggler who's a senior, senior engineer and lifts uh, self-driving uh, autonomous driving unit. Um, he started there as a very junior um, uh, engineer uh, and he made a name for himself. You know, a bunch of, um, you know, well-credentialed people on that team, uh, PhDs from from uh, um, famous universe, machine learning universities, been working on a problem for three months. He took it home over the weekend and got way further over the course of the weekend uh, than that they had gotten over a three-month period. And that's because you Kaggle challenges, you see lots of different data sets um, and you're working to a deadline. And so, um, he was able to look at that problem. He'd seen, a, you know, he'd seen enough problems directionally similar, had a good intuition for what the right approach was going to be. And so he was able to come up with a very, very, very good solution very quickly. And that's how he, he's now a very senior engineer on that team. And that's how he made his name. Um, and so I think Kaggle is outstanding for number two. Um, people say we're irrelevant for number one, which is turning a business problem into a um machine learning problem. I actually don't agree with that. Um, um, I think Kaggle trains that muscle, obviously less directly um, um, than, uh, uh, than the, the actual training of models. But uh, the way it trains that muscle is you see the business problem is described, right, in the text um, of the, the challenge. And then you see how that team set it up. Um, and so you see lots and lots and lots of examples of how different teams have taken a business problem and set it up as a machine learning um, challenge. Um, the, the, the area where I think Kaggle gets dinged, and fairly so, is on number three, uh, taking a prototype model and productionizing um, uh, this is the kind of thing that really you have to be inside a company that's productionizing models in order to get experience of. But it's not like, I don't think today that people are missing out on a lot. Um, the process of handing a model that has you know, been um, prototyped in a Jupyter notebook and then productionized is an incredibly painful thing. It's not like there is a wonderful, I, and, and by the way, I think this will change over the next few years, years but I, I don't think that somebody is going to be going to somebody trained on Kaggle is going to go into a company and think, oh, there's this whole world of things that are sort of well-established practices that I don't know. Um, I think uh, number three is currently a mess. Um, um, and it, it's a painful thing in, in just about any company you go and work for. Um, so mm. so I, I just don't think that you're missing out on too much. It's, yeah, it's going to be painful whether you've come up through engineering at Google or um, you've come up through Kaggle. So I'm going to channel some of our audience. I know just from the the comments that we get and the um, the questions in the Slack channel. I think you know I think we have a lot of folks um, that are kind of trying to break into Silicon Valley type um, jobs, and I think Kaggle's a, a good way to do that. Do Do you have any advice for someone that's um, you know trying to get into machine learning through Kaggle? Like, have you seen that work for people and and how that yeah. process has gone? A absolutely. Um, Kaggle is now at this point a pretty well-recognized credential um, and, in my view, a faster, more accessible way to break in than, you know, a PhD from Stanford or the University of Toronto. Um, in your um, unbiased view. <laughs> in my completely unbiased view. Um, um, I mean, we see people, um, the, the the top, anyone who's a grandmaster on Kaggle, and, and I think if you work at it, you can, look, you can get a PhD in five years if you really work at it. Um, you can go from, you know, an engineer who's okay with math um, to a grandmaster in a year. Um, and so, and it doesn't cost you, you know, whatever, uh, you know, whatever student debt, et cetera. Um, but how do you, how do you actually do that? Like, what do you, is it just doing competitions or? 
it's doing competitions, it's reading the forums, it's we have casual notebooks where you can um, start with other people's code, you fork it, you ask a lot of questions in the in the forums. Um, um, and uh, you can become a grandmaster across one of four dimensions. Um, uh, you can be a competition grandmaster, a data sets grandmaster, a discussion grandmaster, and a notebooks grandmaster. Um, in, in rank order, the most respected, um, probably by employers, is competitions. Um, in, in, my, um, in my view, unjustifiably so. Um, we prefer people who are um, either notebooks or um, discussion grandmasters. And the reason being is you have to be insightful enough that you're writing comments that people upvote or you're writing notebooks that people upvote and you have to write clear enough code or communicate clearly enough um, th that you would also make it make for a you know it's the kind of thing you want on a team i would pick one of those three categories and the kinds of places you know nvidia has hired somewhere in the order of 20 10 to 20 i'm not sure exa the exact number kaggle grand grandmasters over the last let's say six months um so they've been on a hiring tear for kaggle grandmasters uh deep mind has hired um uh, quite a few um um h2o have a team of about 15 or so uh kaggle grandmasters so there's a there it's it's not a credential that every company uh goes for but a significant a meaningful amount of top AI companies uh, value this credential. Uh, and then once you've got your first job, you're, you're in, right? You'll continue to get other good jobs. I feel compelled to add that I also love to see Kaggle credentials on a um, resume. Weights and and for me, and Weights and Vices, top uh, ML company. But I, I'll say for me, um, I even appreciate, you know, we, we hire a lot of engineers, you know, back end, front end. And, and um, you know, sometimes they... You know, it'll just be like, "Hey, I did a couple Kaggle competitions," and and I think that just says so many good things about um, a prospective uh, employee. I'd love to see it. So, um, you know, I I I I I just totally agree with you. I guess I'm I'm maybe slightly less um, obviously biased, but I um, I love Kaggle credentials, and and I love it when people share them on their resume. Um, you know, one thing I want to make sure I had time to um, to get to, just because you've told me kind of. Privately, I think that in some ways the 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 maybe lesser known publicly Kaggle products have um, in some ways more traction than the competition product. Right? I mean, could you, could you say what the other ones are and why you decided to build them and and how they're doing? Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, Kaggle between twenty ten and twenty fifteen, we we're all machine learning competitions, um, um, and. We always thought that machine learning competition is very powerful, but also not going to appeal to everybody. And as data science, machine learning grew as a profession, we wanted to make sure that we were continuing to grow with it. Um, the first thing we launched is Kaggle Notebooks, which is basically a hosted Jupyter Notebook. Um, and the really, you can have a, um, uh, it doesn't cost you anything. You get a CPU, a GPU, or a TPU. Um, so you get some, you get as much CPU as you want, uh, and then you get 30 hours a week of either, of uh, GPU and TPU. So you get quite a lot of free accelerator as That's well. That's so great it's, it's that you do deal. that. That's awesome. You know, we're part of Google. This is how, you know, we would not have been able to do this as a, a standalone company. Um, but the the really nice thing here is, you know, you come to a Kaggle, any notebook on Kaggle, you can hit the, the copy and edit button. Uh, we used to call it fork. And you get somebody else's code running in an environment that will run it, right? So it's completely reproducible. Um, we launched it initially inside competitions because we noticed people uh, sharing their code in, for in forum posts, either linking to a GitHub repo or um, uh, you know, attaching, attaching a Python script. Um, we also noticed that those forum posts... Um, People came to Kaggle to learn. Those should be the most valuable forum posts. They got dramatically less interest than forum posts where people shared ideas. So it's like the most valuable content was not really getting utilized. And that's because, you know, you get someone's Python script, you have to get the same version of Python, the same version of, you know, are you on the right side of TensorFlow 1.0, 2.0, like all, all, all these dependencies. It's like really it takes some number of hours to get somebody else's code to run and then you don't know if it's any good, right? And so if we could create an environment where it was much easier for people to share code and not have to worry about the the, the environment behind it, and that was the the insight between behind Kaggle Notebooks, we have somewhere in the order of 800,000 users every month, um, uh, 
Actually, uh, it might have. I'm on parental leave, so my not my knowledge <laughs> of the data might be a little out of date. It might be over a million people a month uh, looking at um, other people's notebooks, which is just extraordinary. Um, the other product we have, kind of like how people share videos on YouTube, we allow people to share data sets on Kaggle. And where this grew out of is um, we noticed when we launched Kaggle notebooks, they were initially only useful um, for people competing in competitions to share code alongside competitions. Um, but we noticed people kind of sh using Kaggle notebooks to share kind of more freeform insights. And so it's like, oh, wouldn't it be great if we gave uh, you know people data sets as well uh, that they could do more freeform uh, type work on. And so we launched this platform where anyone can share any data set. Um, and we have... Uh, at least last time I looked at the metrics, which again was before parental leave, was uh, over 400,000 people a month downloading Kaggle data sets. So I think these are, you know, remember that we're a data science machine learning site. It's, um, it's still a, a, an emerging profession. And to have those sorts of numbers um, on these products, that they're, they're, they're getting really meaningful traction. Um, yeah, that's really also incredible. A, and they're also a nice way, like if you don't, a Kaggle competition is tremendous commitment. If you want to um, get involved in Kaggle, but don't have the time to put into a competition, these are ways to get involved in a lighter weight way. Do you have um, a favorite kernel or data set that, uh, that maybe doesn't get as much attention as it deserves? Um, oh, man, there's lots. There are all sorts of things. Somebody uploaded a data set looking, taking x-rays and you had to... Um, predict the age of the person based on their x-rays. It was called a bone age data set, which I thought was kind of cool. That is really um, cool. Wow. Just like really random. <laughs> um, oh, man, what else? We got a lot of cool COVID-19 data sets. Actually, one of the things that has been nice um, with the COVID-19 data sets that have been shared is that, you know, you've got the John Hopkins University data set for instance and everyone's looking at that one thing that people is, have been doing on Kaggle which is really powerful is they've been creating these very rich panels where they join the John Hopkins data set to um, daily data from the nearest weather station right mm. um, um, and so there's this debate about you know how does temperature and seasonality impact um, the transmission of COVID-19 well somebody has just and I've seen some of these studies, like some study will look at 100 cities in China um, and um, draw some conclusion about the rate of transmission and how temperature impacts. Well, well people in the Kaggle community have just like hand delivered all whatever 4,000 um, locations with the, with the nearest weather station. And so those, those kind of things are also, I think, really cool and really powerful. That is so cool. And it's been out for, for four or five years, I guess? Uh, Kaggle data sets launched. So Kaggle notebooks launched in 2015 um, and data sets, and that was about May. Uh, and, and by the way, Kaggle notebooks really started as an edit, like it started as an edit box with a run button. Uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> very, uh, um, and, and, and we also launched, um, we, we, we launched very lightweight. We launched with R, not Python. Uh, and then oh, wow. The That's one, a sign of the, the times. Number, wow. That is amazing. The, the number one feature request was, can you, can you add Python? <laughs> Although I should say, just, just, on, just on R, still some of the most beautiful notebooks are written in R. Um, uh, so still, particularly for data, data analysis, data visualization, it, it does really, it does well on Kaggle, like the be beautiful content uh, still created with R. Um, uh, and then uh, data sets launched in August of 2016. That's okay. You know, it's funny. I, I really want to ask. These are just the questions I selfishly want to ask, but I guess it's my show, so I can do it. When you when you look at the um, when you look at the tools people are using, I mean, just as an example, is do people use anything besides Python and R? And do people actually like win competitions with R? I say this as a longtime R user who switched to Python, so I'm not against R, but it, it does seem like almost everyone has switched at this point. Yeah, I mean, when Kaggle first started, it was like, you know, MATLAB, we even saw SAS, um, we saw a whole lot of stuff, and then it quickly quickly became R. Um, um, and then Python's rise has just been sort of a fairly steady, um, it's just like steadily taken share. Um, 
I'm not actually sure what the numbers are now. Um, I know a couple of years ago it was two thirds Python, one third R. I'm, I suspect it's probably closer to 90% Python, 10% R now. I'm actually not certain of that though. I'm not aware really of R doing particularly well in um, competitions. I think Python is hard to beat, like the the support for neural networks, et cetera, et cetera, is uh, I think a fair bit stronger in Python. And, and so I'd say the place where R has really shone in the community is beautiful, beautiful notebooks. Um, you know, new competition launches, and somebody writes a notebook. Uh, we have a, a user I have in mind when I think of, you know, I have a persona in mind, he, heads or tails is his uh, Kaggle alias, right? It's beautiful R notebooks, sort of helping uh, anyone competing in the competition get their arms around, you know, what's in that data set. Uh, so it still plays a nice role. Um, I'd say that we've seen a bit, to the extent that people are using different types of technologies on Kaggle, um, we had a, a challenge fairly recently um, where H2O, uh, driverless AI, did, did really well. It was a forecasting challenge. Um, we've had challenges in the past where Google's AutoML have done well. Um, I, I happen to be a huge believer in that category. Um, um, you know, so much of training a neural network is turning knobs, right? Why, why, why shouldn't that be automated? Um, you know, so even so much of feature engineering, we spoke about this earlier on, you, exploding a date can probably be uh, written into software. Um, so I'm a huge believer in like the next big thing in terms of model training is probably more and more automation of the things that are relatively easier to automate. Um, and then the other place uh, that we've seen new technologies uh, get adopted, like some of the, the things that are generating excitement in the community, we launched TPU uh, notebooks. Um, and that certainly some class of problems where TPUs are doing extremely well. Um, uh, particularly on the natural language processing models, which are very, you know, very, very memory heavy. I think there's a lot of excitement in videos coming out with a new chip, coming out with a new chip soon, uh, which I think there's a lot of excitement around. So any any advances in accelerators uh, gets people excited. Um, and wait, sorry. So this is actually is this faster training times, or literally the models perform better? Um, so, so one of the reasons that um, f faster training times matter is because we give people nine hours Kaggle notebooks. And so, um, it's, so it's faster training times, but we give people, a lot of people are using our, Excel, our Kaggle notebooks. And so yeah. the fact that you can um, train a model faster, um, there also are some issues. I think that um, people have trained things like um, Roberta, which is a particularly memory intensive uh, version of BERT. And so the TPUs we make available have enough memory such that you can train, you know, it's the difference being being able to train a Roberta model and not. Um, right, right. What about frameworks? Like how do, how do they break down? Is, is everyone using TensorFlow or what's a... Uh... No, I think PyTorch is really, um, we just see PyTorch is doing really well. Um, um, it's actually, I don't know, I don't know what the uh, TensorFlow 2.0 was obviously a big release. People love Keras. It's really, um, um, Keras has dominated on Kaggle for a long time and now PyTorch is, um, uh, I'd say maybe Keras and PyTorch, at least last time I checked, was sort of roughly roughly equivalent, but the, the trajectory on PyTorch was very strong. Um, um, uh, I don't know that I have um, a good sense of the, the extent to which TensorFlow 2.0 uh, has, you know, has changed the, the PyTorch TensorFlow, um, you know, what that trajectory looks like yet, but certainly PyTorch's rise has been very, very, uh, re really incredible. And what about like the, like the simpler, the, the sort of like layers on top of, of PyTorch, like Lightning and FastAI and Ignite, like, do, do you see those? Yeah, I mean, fast AI definitely. Um, we see, I think, fast AI. People, quite a lot of people do do that course, and then they. Um, uh, Jeremy mentions Kaggle a fair bit in that course, and so uh, I think that ends up being a decent feeder to Kaggle. Uh, and so people coming out of that course bring fast AI. Um, uh, the other two, not not so much. Hmm. Is there like a like? Do do grandmasters have like different set of tools? Like, do, do you see the more experienced people kind of switching to stuff or? I think what they often have is um, uh, not so much their own tools, but they have their own, um, very often have built like, what's the way to put it? Like their own little framework um, so that when they see a computer vision problem, they're not starting from scratch, but they're right. starting with a, they're starting with code that they, 
that they know well, that they know how to optimize well. Um, and, and by the way, the fact that so many grandmasters are creating their own little frameworks suggests that, you know, the PyTorches and the TensorFlows aren't, you know, there's something missing, right? Maybe it's that people like to do things in their own way, or maybe they're, they're like, you know, slightly too low um, uh, for, for for at least the kinds of, you know, lo low level for the kinds of things that people are doing in the Kaggle community. So what are like the common things that these these frameworks do? Um, it, it's, I, I think it, the, the, they're very often like all the pipeline steps, right? So you've got your, okay, you've got your, um, your new image uh, uh, data set come in. And the first thing you want to do is you want to do data augmentation and they have their preferred way of implementing data augmentation and then passing it on to the next. Uh, so, so I think it's really focused on creating a, a pipeline that starts with a new data set and that ends in a sub, you know, Kaggle submission file. Okay, well, I want to totally shift gears because there's a couple more questions I want to make sure I get to in this time. Um, sure. So uh, this is actually a Lavanya suggestion uh, for a question, and I love it. So I remember you giving a TED talk about the jobs that will lose to machines. I remember you you telling me about it. I thought it was um, super smart, and you you had a um, a way of thinking about the jobs that you should be worried about losing. So I was hoping you could describe that um, to this audience who maybe haven't seen the TED talk. But um, I also was wondering if you're thinking has changed at all since you gave the talk? Because that was now in 2016. Um, and things have changed a bit. Yeah. At the time, maybe it was slightly non-obvious. To me, I, I, it reads now as like very obvious. The basic conclusion is um, jobs are at risk if you're doing the same thing again and again and again, right? Um, um, we, Kaggle had done a path-breaking competition um, taking image of the eye and diagnosing diabetic retinopathy. Um, and the results on that were just outstanding. Um, and we've done a lot of other medical imaging problems. And you think about what, a, you know, this is like not, this is fairly hackneyed at this point, but a radiologist does the same thing again and again and again, right? You know, looking, looking at an image, um, uh, making a diagnosis of that image. Um, or, or an ophthalmologist. Whereas um, if your job requires you to be creative and to be sort of d doing different things on a daily basis, you're probably uh, uh, much safer. Um, you know, some of the professions I think I mentioned in the talk, at least I had in the back of my mind that surprisingly haven't gone, you know, you haven't seen much automation yet is like auditing, vetting of basically legal contracts. Like, do you really need a lawyer to look at yet another relatively boilerplate NDA? Do you really need an auditor to go over the majority, you know, the majority of the company's accounts are probably fairly standard. Um, so there's still a lot of rote work that um, in the four years since the talk, I don't think I'm not aware of a ton of work being done um, to automate. So it sort of points to you know, perhaps opportunities or perhaps things that that um, that still haven't been done. Um, but I but I think the conclusion still stands. You know, I was in 2016 fairly skeptical that we were going to make a lot of progress towards artificial general intelligence. I still like I just don't see it with the the, the current set of tools that we have. I think are incredibly useful and they get they, they're very powerful and they allow, they allow us to do a lot of really cool things. I do, I don't see a path from you know where we are to like. A smooth path from that doesn't involve, you know, multiple step changes from where we are today to AGI, and so um, the, the the distinction between repetitive tasks and tasks that require uh, more creativity and more moving around still sticks to me as true as uh, the, you know where jobs are safe and where they aren't. Do you have any opinions on um, reinforcement learning? I feel like we've seen a lot of interesting stuff um, coming out that certainly feels like. In, like a different kind of intelligence to me. Like, do, do you, um, have you looked at that? Yeah, I, I guess um, with with um, reinforcement learning, um, where Kaggle aims to be is somewhere between where the cutting edge of academia is and where the average Fortune 500 company is, right? Um, and so I guess we believe in reinforcement learning enough that we've started um, actually, maybe this two or three weeks ago, um, we launched our second ever uh, simulation competition. It was with Two Sigma, where people are writing AI bots to um, beat each other in a game called Halite. Um, um, we we ha in January we tested the concept with a ConnectX, um, you know, a, g a game of ConnectX, um, and so we are now investing in. Um, um, uh, reinforcement learning. Um, you know, I have heard of some cool, 
you know, pragmatic applications as a well well covered uh, DeepMind optimizing um, data Google data centers. Um, uh, I've he heard about um, uh, potential uses in search, in ad targeting, in um, uh, st stock market trading. So I, I guess I'll start to get, get excited when there are more. Kaggle is excited enough that we're investing and that we're making reinforcement learning challenges available to our community. I'll be more excited than I am today when there's um, more pragmatic use cases that we can point to where it's really making a positive difference. Mm, that makes sense. All right. So we always end it with uh, two questions. Um, so the the penultimate question here um, is, what's the topic um, in machine learning that people don't talk about as much as they should? I mean, one of the things I'm really energized about at the moment, just particularly with the success of Kaggle's data sets platform, is um, I want to make it easier for people to find access and join external data sets to their own data sets. Um, um, uh, data sets, there are raw material, right? And so the more the easier it is for us to integrate them into our um, machine learning algorithms, the, the more powerful our work is going to be. And so that's one area. Um, and then the second one is one I mentioned earlier, uh, gradient boosting machines still do incredibly well in Kaggle challenges, right? And it's just not an area of academic study at all. Um, and it makes me wonder, is there more that could be done? You know, is that this an area that's being overlooked? Is there more that could be done? Um, around gradient boosting machine like technologies, mm. have we abandoned them too fast? You know, it's funny. I, I worked a lot in, in gradient boosted trees um, back in the day. It's probably the algorithm I've spent the most time with, and um, I remember feeling like they had trouble learning linear relationships. Like they're so good, um, you know, at these like step function things. But is is it just gradient boosted trees, or is it do people add more weak learners to their gradient boosting? What we typically find with structured data problems is people will train a, um, whether it's XGBoost or LightGBM or some gradient boosting machines framework. And if if you look at it, that is what's doing 99.9% .9 of uh, uh, the work. Uh, uh -huh. Very often people will ensemble in other things um, oh, just to get a bit more div diversity. Um, in most cases, I, I think that it really, ensembling other things helps take you from you know, 20th to first. Um, mm -hmm. But actually, when a company looks to productionize a model that comes out of a Kaggle challenge, they will strip out all the other stuff, right? Because you just don't want the complexity. Um, so um, if you can, so, so I think gradient boosting machines is really typically enough um, mm -hmm. um, on most structures. That, that plus clever feature engineering is enough on most structured data problems. Got it. That was really, I'm glad I asked. That was interesting. Um, Final, so final question is uh, is it, like when you look at and this is maybe outside of Kaggle but like at Google and and all the companies that you've talked to when you look at the sort of path from like inception to deployed machine learning software where do you see the biggest bottlenecks? I like this analogy. There's this um, company at the moment that's pretty hot called Webflow, and what they do is they um, they help with the seam between. Um, um, a, a designer um, and a uh, and a front end engineer um, by making it much easier to get a design into uh, into HTML, CSS, um, uh, JavaScript code, um, and I, I think that that's probably an area getting it, taking a prototype model written in Python, um, you know, possibly in Jupyter notebooks into a production system, you know, maybe the production system is in Java or, or something else is, is really nasty. Um, um, you've seen a bunch of companies invest. Google obviously has invested internally. Uber invested in a system called Michelangelo. There's a lot of systems that have been built um, in uh, inside companies to try and uh, try and solve that problem. Um, but those systems, you know, there's a bunch of startups now trying to take those systems that have been built uh, uh, internally for the likes of Google, for the likes of Uber, um, and to make them available. Um, to the wider world, I think that's definitely a problem that that urgently needs to be solved. You know, the seam between data scientist or machine learning researcher and uh, data 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 engineer is a really gnarly seam at the moment. Well said, awesome. Well, thanks so much, Ashley. That was that was really fun. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for having me. 
when we first started making these videos, we didn't know if anyone would be interested or, or want to see them, but we made them for fun. And we started off by making videos that would teach people. And now we get these great interviews with real industry practitioners. And I love making this available to the whole world so everyone can watch these things for free. The more feedback you give us, the better stuff we can produce. So please subscribe, leave a comment, engage with us. We really appreciate it.